Hi guys, uh, this video is to go over standard 2.6. Um, it does cover some of 2.5. We'll kind of, <coughs> excuse me, we'll use what we learned in 2.5 to transition and learn some stuff about 2.6. And in fact, um, hopefully you had opportunities to practice what you were learning in class. So we are going to just jump right in with the example that you tried at the end of class. I'm going to give you kind of the answer to how you would do this. Um, so at the end of class, I, I believe I asked you, how would you draw an electron dot diagram for O3? Um, this is ozone, by the way. And keep in mind, you cannot make it into a triangle. You have to choose a central atom. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have three oxygens. One of them has to be a central atom. So I'm going to just draw them in a row. Each have six electrons in their valence shell. And we have to get a little bit creative. We have to break some of our rules here in order to make this work. Okay. Um, when there's only one central atom, I typically start there. If there were two central atoms, I would probably attach the terminal atoms first. And I don't know, it just seems to be a little easier in my opinion. But I always, I've, I've done this many times and I, and when I was first learning how to draw this loose dot structure, I'd get stuck here. I'd get stuck and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. This is crazy. <laughs> um, and then I would maybe try, you know, buddying up this unpaired electron with <coughs> one of these, which is not the, it's not the end of the world. Of course, if I, and then, and then inevitably I would try pairing this one up with one of these, and then I'd end up with a structure that looks like this. Okay. And what's wrong? with this structure. It's right here. Um, what's wrong with this structure is this oxygen is not following the octet rule. Um, it has six electrons that it contributed, one, two, three, four, five, six, that it contributed to this bond. But right now it contains two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. That's too many. You want to try to follow the electro, uh, the octet rule. Okay. So instead what happens um, is that there will be an electron. I'm going to say um, this one that did not buddy up here is going to leave this spot. So that way we have an exact octet there. It leaves. And where might it go? It's going to go right here to make a buddy for this guy, right? It's gonna be a buddy, but it will not be bonded. And that's okay. So I'm drawing an arrow to kind of indicate that it's leaving that spot and traveling here. <clears throat> and um, that's kind of different. This electron has moved over. So now if I redraw this, <coughs> so sorry. I've got three sections of bonded electrons or well electrons off of the central atom. I've got a double bond here. I've got a single bond here and I've got this pair. I've got three things. I'm going to put that at 120 degrees or thereabouts when I draw it. It does have a bent structure. And then I'm going to put uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then the sixth electron around this one. Again, I'm pairing them up and putting them as far from each other as I can possibly get. Okay. This is actually the, I mean, this is the real um, structure of ozone. Okay. This is the real structure of ozone. And um, I might have even made this model for you in class if we solved it together in class. Um, if not, I will gladly show you in class tomorrow what this looks like. Um, but we know that in real life, there is still some repulsion between these electrons that are being shared, these two bonds. 
And there is kind of like this, <coughs> excuse me, bowing there. Um, when we represent it using the, um, the like atom, the molecule kit that we have in class, um, double bonds really do look differently than single bonds. Which of these bonds is longer? Hopefully you said the single bond, right? The more electrons that are shared, the closer the bond becomes. So really we should have a situation where this is a much shorter bond length than this one, okay? You'll never believe what scientists found out when they actually uh, studied ozone and molecules like it. These bond lengths were found to be the same. What a conundrum. And they had to figure out a way to explain that. Why <coughs> would this bond length be the same as this bond length? When clearly this is a double bond and it should be shorter. And most of the time, double bonds are shorter. So what in the world is going on here? So really what happened, uh, what happens here is that there is resonance. They use this, they use this idea of resonance to explain it. I'm going to um, redraw this over here. Okay. Then <coughs> they use this idea of resonance. And there, there are um, studies and data to support this, obviously, or else they wouldn't hold on to this so much. But I'm um, trying to get the glare off of the whiteboard here. <clears throat> I wonder if it would help if I did that. No, nope, not really. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, okay. So we've got this structure, but what they found is that this molecule will spend some time looking the opposite way. And initially they, they imagined this or um, saw this as kind of an oscillating thing, that the molecule would oscillate between this structure and this structure. The electrons would move. And I'm gonna show you how they envisioned this movement of electrons. You need to be able to track this movement, okay? <clears throat> They envisioned that this, this pair of electrons um, in the bond, that they would both move out here and become unbonded, an unbonded pair. And you can see that because now we have a single bond left here and we have three unbonded pairs of electrons. Then this pair of electrons would be free to move in to become a second double bond or a second bond there a double bond so um if it moved in then you can see how we have only two unbonded pairs of electrons here and a double bond okay so there's a movement of electrons that enables the double bond to switch from one side to another there is um more current data that suggests that this is not the most accurate way of thinking about it, but we still use this model <clears throat> to kind of explain um, resonance structures and to kind of explain why the bond length might be the same here as it is here. Okay, um, now we know that um, they do resonate between the two structures, but it's not a, an oscillation and they're not doing a strict movement here. It's kind of um, a hybridization type of situation. So that gets discussed in later videos in the year. But for now, you do need to be able to use this model to explain resonance and to show it. Um, oftentimes we take the resonance structure, we put it in a big bracket for all the resonance structure or, well, wait, do we do it that way? Maybe we do it this way. Sometimes we do it this way. This is a bit especially useful if it has a charge, you know, like a, a one minus or a, or a two minus. We'll see an example of that coming right up. But for right now, um, might just see it looking like this, okay? This is how to draw resonance structures. 
there are there are several examples of these. You can probably Google different examples of resonance structures and just look at the images to see um, several examples, and you can get familiar with those. Um, since there really aren't that many molecules that do this, if you go and you look it up, you will probably get a good idea of what all of them look like and any that might show up on a test. So that's an option. Um, there's one more thing with resonance structures that is pretty important, um, and that's this idea of formal charge. So these are resonant structures or resonance structures, either way you want to call it. <clears throat> these are resonance structures. Now we're going to learn how to use formal charge to decide if there is one better version of this than the other, if there's one best way to represent it. Okay, the formal charge looks at, um, it looks at how many electrons each atom would have contributed to the molecule, and it looks at how many electrons it has now, and it compares the two. So each oxygen, when it was, um, when it first contributed to the molecule, how many electrons did each oxygen have? Six, right? It had this structure. It had um, six valence electrons, okay? So each is supposed to contribute six. I will sometimes draw um, a circle around it and I will just kind of um, mentally know that that represents like a one, two electrons. It contributed one electron to this, this bond and one electron to this bond. This oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. And it originally contributed six. Six minus six is zero. The formal charge on this atom is zero. We need to do this for every atom in the molecule. This oxygen contributed six, but now it has one, two, three, four, five. It only has five. It has one less electron than what it should have. Um, and so, we take what it sh um, what it should have. <clears throat> I feel like I'm doing this wrong. Um, minus what it has. We have one. Oh yeah, I don't. I, this looks so backwards. I don't want to like display it that way. Um, okay, let's just say this: electrons are negatively charged, right? It has one less electron than what it should have. It has a resonance of or a formal charge of plus one. And then this oxygen, take a look at that one, two, four, six, seven. It has an extra electron attached to it than what it would have normally had at the beginning. Electrons being negatively charged, we'll do a negative one right there, okay? Overall, the charge of this molecule is still zero. Plus one, not minus one, equals zero. And we now know that um, these don't carry actual charges. It's not like it's not like a, a, a difference in the partial charge. You know, this does not affect polarity. This doesn't have a, an effect on how it interacts with other molecules and intermolecular forces. Because of that, um, this literally is only intended for us to track the movement of electrons. And in fact, when we originally drew this, we, sh we showed how one electron had to leave this central atom and join in with that atom, with this terminal oxygen, right? So this is just another way of showing that movement of electrons. Let's go ahead and assign formal charges over here. This oxygen now is, has one, two, three, four, five, six, and it contributes one electron to this bond. So that's seven total. It's formal charge. It has one extra electron, so it's going to be negative one. This one has one, two, three, four, five. And again, same deal as before. It, is, it has one less electron than what it had originally, so we give it a plus one charge. And the formal charge on this one is zero because it has one, two, three, four, and then five, six. One electron contributed to this bond. One contributed to that bond. It has six. Okay, so that's how we assign formal charges. Um, it does so happen 
that the formal charges will add up to the overall charge of the molecule. And that is always the case. But like I said, I kind of have to be careful with this because this does not carry actual charges when we talk about intermolecular forces. It's not like in a sample of ozone that one molecule looking like this is going to experience an attraction from the <clears throat> negative of one to the positive of another. That's not the case, okay? So let me be clear, these charges do not have an effect on attractive forces. These charges are not like ionic charges. These are, we call them formal charges. We assign them just to show where the electrons went. Okay, let's try another example. <coughs> Excuse me. We are going to do CO3. This is a carbonate ion. If you look at your polyatomic sheet, it has a charge of two negative. Um, in real life, this molecule would be paired up with um, a cation of some kind, um, perhaps magnesium, perhaps sodium. It'd be like sodium carbonate, magnesium carbonate. But um, we're just going to show the molecule itself, okay? Now, I want you to try this on your own. Try drawing the Lewis dot structure, like an initial Lewis dot structure, okay? And then compare and see how you did. All right. Um, so again, we have this sort of conundrum where things don't match up the way we expect. Um, we're going to make buddies where we can. But for, let's just make one bond connecting everything, okay? Make one bond connecting everything. Then um, in order to complete the central atoms octet, we'll connect this one to another one, okay? But here we get a little stuck. We cannot connect these two because that kind of takes away from having carbon as our central atom. Instead, we are going to take this two minus charge, and that means that we have two extra electrons, okay? We get, we get like an extra bank of electrons. We get two extra. And one will go here, and one will go here to make buddies. Now this unbonded electron has a pair, all right? Let me redraw this. Um, I might as well just kind of go over here. I'm going to end up drawing some resonance structures. Okay. Um, I'm going to make, oh shoot. I'll make these as far from each other as I possibly can and they'll be about 120 degrees, right? All right. And, okay. So this one did not have like a movement of electrons. We're gonna see what happens if we assign a formal charge to this one. By the way, the last um, ozone doesn't have one better resonance structure than any other one. It just doesn't, it's the same. I mean, the formal charges show that there's just one, um, that it's like the same thing. So there's no preferred structure over the other. Um, let's go in here and see if there are some formal charges. So this oxygen contributed one, two, three, four, and then it contributes one to this and one to this. That's six total. The charge on this is zero. Happy day. That's pretty exciting. Um, the carbon, um, let's see, do you want... Yeah, carbon contributed four electrons, and um, that has stayed the same here. So carbon also has a formal charge of zero. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It has an extra electron, right? Because oxygens should have six electrons in the valence. Right now, this oxygen is responsible for seven. Electrons being negatively charged, that gets a formal charge of negative one. 
And the same exact thing is gonna happen right here because it's the same, I mean, it's the same structure. That also gets a charge of negative one. What's the overall charge again for carbonate? It's two minus. So like I said before, these are gonna add up to the actual charge. But keep in mind, because of the fact that there's resonance involved, there will be resonance involved, um, that we'll come to find there is a resonance structure. Because of that, um, the electrons don't all spend their time this way. We know that there is a resonance structure um, and there's some hybridization. So um, the bond lengths are all the same and there's not one of these oxygens that's going to be more negatively charged than another. It doesn't, it doesn't change the interactions between molecules. But that's formal charge for you, okay? Now, let's find the resonance structure. I want you to see if you can figure out how, the, how we would model the movement of electrons and how we would draw the resonance structure. Okay. So we have a double bond. I kind of, sometimes I like to start there. It just makes my life easier. Two electrons from the double bond are gonna move out to the terminal atom. Then we, uh, then carbon would be left with only one, two, three pairs, which makes a total of six electrons. It needs to have eight, right? So we have to make a double bond somewhere else. Let's say that we moved these two in to make a double bond. And there you go, okay? That is one resonance structure. If they move in this pattern, then this one becomes a single bonded oxygen. And this oxygen becomes doubly bonded with two unbonded pairs of electrons. This one stays the same. And guess what? Our formal charges will follow basically the same pattern. I don't have to count them all up again if I don't want to. The double bonded one is gonna be zero. This one's gonna be minus one, minus one. Carbon's gonna be zero, okay? Formal charges work that way. Again, you would need to officially show a bracket and the actual charge. That is necessary, not optional, okay? You have to show this two minus and the whole thing in brackets because this is a polyatomic ion. I'm running out of space here to do this whole like arrow business. <laughs> um, we'll pretend that um, what I'm gonna draw down here is actually up there. Okay, and then there is actually one other resonance structure because guess what? We can move the electrons again. How would I move the electrons this time. Okay, hopefully you said that the double bond will take its electrons and move them to, to the terminal atom. And then the last one that has not been doubly bonded is going to become doubly bonded, okay? This is the last structure. Those will move in, this one will remain. Okay, so then we would draw it the third way. This is such a common thing with oxygen, by the way. Like any molecule that has oxygen as a terminal atom, any molecule that has a double bond and some single bonds like this, um, pretty much always end up following the same pattern. There it is. And if it asks you to, you should label the formal charges again, zero, zero, negative one, negative one. Okay, now I am being particular. Um, I've, I've tried in the past to teach you how ions, when they have a charge, you always do like two minus. If it's a one minus, you just do a little minus. Um, or if it's three minus, you do three minus. You don't do minus two or minus three. But here, when we are signing formal charges, we do it that way. The negative goes in front of the number. Okay.
not to confuse you. It's just, it's just how it usually is in um, science. Okay. So you're going to have some practice tomorrow with resonance structures um, and formal charges. As we can see here, there is no one way that's best. You are going to end up seeing an example probably tomorrow in class where um, where all the formal charges are, there's an option where all the formal charges are zero, and then there's a resonance structure where the formal charges are not all zero. Um, like these ones, okay? And if there is one where they're all zero, that's preferred. That's going to be the preferred structure. In this case, they're all um, equally different. I mean, they're all the. I mean, they're all the same. Okay. All right. Um, present. We did O three. We did CO three two negative. Okay. So just to kind of wrap things up, resonance is when you have more than one Lewis dot diagram that's acceptable. And if that's the case, you have to draw the resonance structures. When there is more than one Lewis dot diagram possible, you have to draw the resonance structures. You don't get a choice. Um, in fact, you could lose points on the AP exam if you don't do that. Formal charge. Um, the formal charge is a number value assigned to each atom in a Lewis structure to show um, any movement of electrons. <laughs> Okay, the wording for this, this goes in your packet, again, if you're um, keeping track of your, um, <clears throat> keeping track of your progress and each of the standards. It says that you should be able to represent a molecule with a Lewis diagram that accounts for resonance between equivalent structures or that uses formal charge to select between non-equivalent structures. So um, you'll see an, an example of non-equivalent structures in class. Um, there is actually more that we could talk about regarding the bond length and hybridization and all of that. But again, we get to that later on. So for now, um, that's all that you need to know about resonance and formal charges. And um, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that um, we are now a little over halfway through the unit for unit two. We've done 1.8, which is included in unit two for us. We've done 2.1. We did uh, 2.3, 2.4, and 2.5 in the last video. This video covers 2.6. And then the last video that I have for you is going to cover um, two separate ideas, uh, 2.7, which is... Um, very much connected to what we just learned with resonance structures and formal charges. Um, but it also goes back to the shapes of molecules, the sepper or vesper. And, um, and then separately, we're going to kind of wrap things up with 2.2. Um, honestly, I could have done 2.2 at the beginning or I could have done it at the end. And I was just like, doesn't really matter. I just feel like it didn't fit where it was. So we'll do 2.2 to kind of wrap things up in the next video as well. And then um, you will have, um, you will begin preparing for a test. So um, again, this class moves very quickly. Um, we may have a second lab for this unit. In fact, I'm probably going to try to have a second lab for this unit. So um, that could add a little bit more time before a test. But this class moves very quickly, and you need to um, make sure that you are keeping up, asking questions when you're not sure, and um, doing your part. So thanks, guys, for watching, and I'll see you in class.